Welcome to The Spawn Chunks, episode number 281 for Monday, January 22nd, 2024. My name is Johnny, but the internet knows me as Pixel Riffs, and joining me as always is a lightly risen Joel Duggan. Hi, Joel. <laughs> to really understand the irony behind that, you'll have to listen to The Render Distance, which is the extended version of the podcast where I shared my experience this weekend of breaking bread, air quotes, bread. Uh, and if you'd like more of that, then go to patreon.com slash the spawn chunks. Uh, people that support the show as they wonderfully do get access to extra content. There's an extended version of the podcast. There is the monthly Minecraft hangout coming out this Saturday, January 27th, and the quarterly hangout, which is where we talk about the facts and figures and behind the scenes about the spawn chunks is coming up on Saturday, February 3rd. So you can keep an eye on the announcements channel in the discord for all of that. Speaking of the Discord, there's a number of people here live listening to this recording, another perk of being a patron of the Spawn Chunks. And uh, if you missed last week's episode where we interviewed Nembon from Mojang and talked to him about all of the stuff that he was up to in Minecraft lately, along with some of the stuff that he's developing for upcoming versions of Minecraft, we also chatted to him on the render distance as well. So we got a little bit of extra time with Nembon, a couple of minutes either side of the main podcast. So once again, check that out if you're interested in helping to support the show. Uh, but let's log in. Joel, what have you been up to in Minecraft this week? I have been poking and puttering around in West Hill Valley. Uh, the last time we spoke, I was finishing up the riverbanks along the East River. That is now done. Little kind of corners in, in areas next to builds, like where a bridge meets the riverbank. I wanted to do a couple of custom bushes and just landscape things uh, using that technique of Here's a big area of the riverbank that needs to be done. Here's another key area like a, a nook by a river, uh, by a bridge. But then the area in between, I kind of had to go through and like smooth some stuff out, plant some flowers, trying to make it blend from one area to the other and have it all make sense. Uh, little places where I have points of interest, like maybe a little fishing dock or maybe a little boat dock. And then unfortunately, the area right across from that was ugly and untouched. And I didn't turn it into a build, I just kind of smoothed out the landscape, you know, removed things that look kind of dumb. I filled in a lot more grass, made it look a little bit more grown over, that kind of thing. Not overly hard, a little bit time consuming, a little bit repetitive, but in the end, I think really rewarding because then now I, when I approach West Hill from the East, I really feel like it's a, it's a vibe, you know, to, to use that term. And just like when you're walking up to the east gate you've got everything to your left and to your right has been kind of manipulated to kind of pull you in the right direction and and give a nice kind of i'm gonna say cozy i guess you know it's very green and it feels like it's been there a long time i think that's the big thing is that because the town looks very established if you don't do enough landscaping around it it feels kind of plunked on like the empty minecraft landscape Whereas if you start having overgrown riverbanks and you start to have bushes that are like spilling out over your builds, I talked a lot about layers over the course of the week as I was streaming. And I think that was the main thing that I took away from this is that, you know, it's, it's a slow process, but as you go through it, you can start to see the layers and layers to me in Minecraft equals time or the impression of time in an area where things have been overgrown or things have been trodden by people walking over paths over time, that kind of stuff. So that that was a lot of fun to to have something I can check off in my little book with uh, the East River. And then I just kept going. I, I moved up the West Hill River heading north. I've got the wheat farm and the areas around the wheat farm adding little points of interest, little bits like where the canal empties into the river, having a little bit of sand and, you know, um, path blocks and stuff there. There's a path behind the barn that goes to the river for, I don't know, maybe that's where they're getting buckets of water. Who knows? Just little things like that, that I feel add life to an area because I don't have any villagers roaming around because I don't want to, uh, you know, there's no movement in most of Minecraft. So having all that kind of stuff was nice. Uh, and then I just, keep on going down the road. Like it just, it's one of those things where once you're in one of these texture grooves, it's very easy to just kind of keep on going. If anything, the trick is to restrain yourself. So you're not texturing a hundred blocks into the distance that don't matter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm sure you've probably found this where you're like, okay, I need to like stop making this road because now I'm just doing stuff that doesn't matter. And I was surprised at how 
little effort was involved because I thought, oh man, this East Farm Road that runs north south along the, the valley is a long road. It's not overly interesting. There's like a farm on one side and a hill on the other. And I thought, man, I've got to texture this and keep it interesting. There is a bridge about halfway down that's in, that's cool. But like to try and make it feel again, like it's been there for a while. I just ended up using this technique called uh, the, the, where I was using moss blocks and kind of speckling moss around along the edge, a little bit of moss carpet here and there, really trying not to overdo it. And then just manipulating some grass and some, some leaf blocks. And then I had obviously textured the road, but I really wasn't doing a whole lot there. Now I have the advantage of having a custom course dirt texture that has like some random pebbles in it. So that helps considerably. Uh, but I was using uh, packed mud, brown concrete powder, coarse dirt is the main block and uh, rooted dirt is the one that I was using for like highlights and like high higher areas, which looks really good next to moss because it kind of feels like the, the dirt and moss are kind of intermingling a little bit. But I was surprised at how effective the change in grass texture by using moss blocks and a little bit of carpet was at giving an edge to the road. It made the road feel like it was sinking, you mm -hmm. know, and I think it's because the moss blocks are a little bit lighter than regular grass. So it kind of makes the brighter edges of the road uh, advance vertically. And then the darker brown of the road recede in an optical illusion, even though there is no real height difference, unless I've added a moss carpet, which actually does add that pixel of difference. But I'm I'm really happy with the way that it came out. It's um, There's no giant build to show off at the end of the week. It's just like, look, all this stuff is now kind of final and done. And I, I like that I'm moving through this checklist in the valley. And, uh, I, I do feel like I'm kind of poking a bit, which I think it's just like a mentality I've got to get past. Like, I don't feel like I'm, I feel like I'm accomplishing something cause I know that I'm making progress, but I, I don't know that I'm, it doesn't feel like I'm moving closer to the end of the build. It feels like I'm kind of puttering, but these are things that need to be done. So I'm kind of like staying to the list and just like, look, you wrote all this stuff down, just go down the list. And then when you're done, you will have less to do, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like if you're thinking of it like a single build, it's like the way when you add leaves and stuff around the outside of a building to add bushes as though it's been there for a while, suddenly everything feels like a natural part of the landscape. You're doing that, but for a town. And so the scale is naturally broadening slightly, and you've got this sort of Lion King, everything the light touches approach to it. Yeah, but ultimately, it is. it's all going to be part of the same picture. And so, you know, if if you're, if you're thinking about this like a, a painting on a canvas, you can't get away with just kind of going, well, a little bit over there on the fields. Like, you've got to, you know, give the impression that the same landscape extends into the distance. So it's uh, obviously a broader scale than most of us are used to working at, but I think you're uh, achieving what you set out to do. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate that. And it's it's coming into like three and a half years. And so I, you know, I, I don't want it to go beyond that. And we'll talk a little bit more you know, about that later in the show. But I'm, I'm looking forward to, to checking this off. And I think the the farm stuff I've been telling myself, you know, I keep on spilling out into this farmland and thinking of more things to do. But in the same way that having, like you said, bushes outside of a build to make it feel like it's been part of the landscape for a while, having a big city or town in the middle of nowhere with like no supportive buildings around it doesn't make any sense either. Yeah. Like where, where do they get their food? You know, where do the people come from? <laughs> you know? Uh, and I, I, not, not everybody wants to live in a city. Some people want to live in the country. And so I think that that, that to me is, is what it was needed now to kind of make this feel like a complete thought is like having that supportive valley outside of West Hill is really what is going to finish off the whole thing. Yeah, you want to avoid it feeling like it's just been plopped down as though it fell out of the sky. Yeah. And that, that makes makes perfect sense. Um, speaking of things that can fall out of the sky, I have finally begun my floating island project in earnest. Um, and uh, there's a lot of planning going into this one. This is a piece uh, that I, I'm structuring around the inspiration of a piece that is now actually available for sale on uh, Gregory Fromento's store, so I can give you a title for it. It is called Pirate Rock Sailing, and uh, the floating island supports a large galleon type of ship, which was the first thing I decided to build. Um, a creative build was going to be necessary to figure out the structure of the ship without a maddening amount of trial and error. 
so instead of building this in survival, I took it to creative and I posted a video about this on my channel today. The idea being, if I start with a ship in the sky, I can build the floating island out underneath it and I know what scale to build that on. Because I've done floating island type of stuff before, but I haven't done a ship on this scale for a while, if not at all before, and I wanted to make sure that it felt realistic and that I wasn't just going to build an island and then find myself with no room to build the ship and have to awkwardly expand it. Um, so I've dropped a couple of screenshots in the live chat for people, maybe those will show up in the show notes as well, and, and apologies for the awkward framing, but I was doing some of these for YouTube thumbnails. I've got as far as... I've arranged a couple of masts so I know where those are going positionally in the ship. I've experimented with a little bit of the rigging and the lines that are attached to the sails. And so all of that stuff I'm kind of just testing out in creative rather than building the entire thing wholesale. Because ultimately I want to leave some of that stuff open to interpretation once I'm in survival. I don't want to try and build this in creative and reproduce it whole cloth exactly the same because I'm not at the point in this series where I want to start introducing mods like Lightmatica to put a template into survival and just build everything from that template. So instead I'm going to be taking measurements, I'm going to be taking lots of screenshots and I'm going to try and reproduce this in survival sort of from scratch without any guidelines to it. Uh, so I'm, I'm just kind of tinkering with, with odds and ends of ideas just done one set of sails, just done one set of rigging or one side of the rigging. And the thing I've got down to now is how I want to incorporate some of the landscape underneath the ship and how I want to use color. And while I was working with this, I started by putting together a block palette for the floating island, which was just going to be stone, tough, cobblestone, bit of deep slate, the kind of gray scale, fairly like neutral grays. But in Greg's original piece, the color that he's used for the sky is also kind of used to shade some of the underside of the island and give like a blue tone to the, the lower half of it. And so I thought maybe I can work in something like Prismarine as well. And I didn't really like it when I tried to build with it in creative and ultimately scrapped that idea as just thinking, well, it's it's one of the things that he's done with the color palette of this piece. We don't have to translate that one for one into a Minecraft build. The grass color he has is yellower, and I'm going to be building this over a plains biome, so I'm probably just going to use normal grass color, and we'll, we'll adapt it for the Minecraft palette. But then later I thought, what if we can make some of the rock formations on the island out of something like prismarine, mix in a bit of diorite and calcite, and then sort of artfully we can make it look like the rock formations also look kind of like waves. And so the ship is cresting the wave of this sort of rock formation that's naturally in there. And I thought that'd be kind of a cool approach, but I'd already started a bit of terraforming using the rock color palette around the front of the ship. So I started doing like a wake for the ship towards the back using prismarine. And I can't decide whether I like that enough to do it the entire way around. And I was kind of hoping for your opinion on that because I kind of, I like the idea, but I'm not sure how well it works in practice. I see what you're doing with the screenshots, which we'll, we will absolutely have in the show notes this week. Uh, uh, at the spawnchunks.com for people that don't know. Uh, I, yeah, I think you'd be, I think around the whole thing, it might look like you're trying to make it look like it's on water with yeah. Minecraft blocks. Whereas if you have it look like mineral deposits or rock outcrops that happen to look like water in like a, a couple of key places, like I can, I can see where you have it now and it makes sense. Like it's a cool effect having it at the back. And I think on a larger scale, like once you see the slope of the island and um, the fact that maybe there's going to be a tree near some some of this, that might help make it look more like land than water or like rock outcrops than water. And I like it at the back. And I think you could maybe have another maybe small section of it around the outside of the bow of the ship where it might be, you know, pushing through water and breaking the waves and whatnot. And I see that you've already got some tough and cobblestone and maybe just like on the round side of that, like around the back from where the screenshots are, if there was another little bit of, of that, you know, um, wave cresting rock look, I think it's really effective. I, I like the concept and I think that it's, it's really cool. Not to mention, I don't think I've seen it done before. So like that immediately is a, is a fun appeal. Um, and I was thinking as you're talking about the underside, you know, where it's really, it's like, it's like environmental perspective slash light bouncing around. So like 
as light bounces around in the same way that the sky is blue because the light's bouncing off you know water and the ocean um light is kind of bouncing off the bottom of the floating island in the art piece but i'm wondering like if you could even have little hints of prismarine and diorite and calcite underneath the uh island and that might help sell the idea of this rock or mineral deposit goes all the way through mm -hmm. and so you could see okay well yeah it looks like a cresting wave up here that's a fun effect but actually i can see this thing as it goes through the whole island like i can see that mineral deposit start there and end at the bottom you might be able to get away with um doing little things like having prismarine but then like putting stairs over it so like you only see like a quarter of the block like just little pops of of color like that might be effective and uh the other thing that would be that color and i don't know how you might feel about this because i'm not sure what it would do for your lighting but glow lichen might be a good way to add a little bit of greeny blue to the underside of things if if you want but yeah i i, I really like that the the mineral deposit idea i think that's awesome Thanks. Yeah, I, I talked a bit about glow lichen when I was making the video, thinking you, that's that's like an element that I could add later to blend it with the terrain. But yeah, I do like the idea of using that to, you know, age and add some color and some light to the the underside of the island. So that's that's certainly something I'll consider. And yeah, I, at this point, I'm mostly done with the the ship as far as I want to build it, and I just want to build underneath that to try and get a feel for the size and the scale of the island and. Uh, at that point, yeah, I'll, I'll be able to bring it into survival. But I'm really happy with how it's gone so far, considering I don't normally build ships all that much. I'm quite pleased with the scale, the amount of detail that I was able to fit into it, because normally I find that there's not enough room to do something that looks as complex as rigging. But this ship is maybe 50 or so blocks long, so there's, there's a, a substantial amount of room here. Um, the other thing I have done is kind of hand in hand with this really like i want to do more building this year and that's something i'm going to talk about later in the in the episode um but i've started a creative build world i started this on stream on thursday where i'm trying to learn more architectural terminology i picked up this book recently called how to read buildings by carol davidson crago and it's a it effectively describes itself as a crash course in architecture L like several different sections of the book go into different elements of buildings in general and it tells you how to identify whether something is in a gothic style versus in you know a roman style or whatever uh the difference between roman and greek columns and how they would use them and everything from renaissance and baroque sort of architecture up through more modern architecture and i i want to give myself a decent foundation in the terminology of architecture so that I can start using that in videos and feel more confident in making tutorials related to build projects for the survival guide because I want to do more building but one of the things that holds me back is feeling like I can't make a fresh tutorial out of it every single time. Um, so we started on the stream with a Greek temple build and learning about columns and my aim is to have this world where if, if you go in one of the cardinal directions you're basically taking a trip through an architectural era and you know maybe we do the greek and roman more of the ancient world stuff if we go north in that world and then if you go south you're going into more modern stuff and it gets more and more modern as you go um a caveat of course a lot of this is going to be focused on western european architecture uh, which i would like to expand outside of europe once i've learned a little more but understanding the te uh, the terminology and the difference between a gable and a dormer and you know the different types of roofs that you can build and that kind of thing i think is something that while it's certainly not necessary for a builder to know in minecraft it can be a really good way of relating that to other people and explaining some of the terminology as you go and i think that's that's something i'm going to try and internalize a little bit more this year so that's uh, my other side side project right now aside from survival guide is just tinkering with this creative build world and seeing what i can come up with working on different scales so we tried to do columns at like a one by one sort of a single block and then just ornaments on that and how goofy does it look when we add stairs to the side of this let's try that with a two by two and see if we can approximate the same style and at what point in the scale does it really feel like we put in enough detail that you can distinguish one type of column from another and so yeah i'm, I'm going through that right now but it's uh, it's it's a fun project it really makes you think about the amount of stuff that goes into real world architecture and occasional frustrations come up about 
the level of detail that we can put into small scale stuff in Minecraft, but as usual, I'm encouraging myself to build bigger, so I think it's going to pay off in the end. It reminds me of the early drafting courses that I took in middle school, because before I went directly down the road of fine art and animation for my career early on, architecture was on the table as like, maybe I want to go architect, engineer. Uh, I had an engineer in the family. So like there's there some, you know, I, would, I wouldn't say push, but there was some draw in that direction to maybe explore that. And so I knew the basics, you know, like roof terms, like gables and and um dormers and all that kind of stuff and as you're saying being up on that terminology while maybe not necessarily for the average minecraft player as a content creator uh, i can say that when i was working in the modern city on the citadel and even in parts of west hill i i had to look up because again not as familiar with medieval terms for things you know and having to figure out what it is and to talk about it articulately and to not just call it like this gable or the weird gable, you know, or the, mm -hmm. you know, this part of the roof, give it his own term to actually come up with what it is, you know, correctly, uh, is, is good because it gives, it gives you an opportunity to keep on talking, you know, cause it, it's, it's frustrating when you want to call something the correct name, but you don't know it because like you haven't taken the time before the stream to look up what it's called. And in some ways I was relying on, uh, I think there's a couple of architects that are part of the community, but also just like asking people to Google stuff on the fly, you know, while mm -hmm. I'm streaming and that kind of stuff. And that's, I think it's great. It's a great, uh, exercise. I no longer have all of the Greek and Roman pillar architecture stuff in my brain. I minored in art history and it was a 8 30 in the morning class for most of my career in university and i did not retain much more than what they required me to regurgitate on the exam <laughs> yeah so i don't remember most most of them um i remember freezes I, but those are sculptural those are like the little details of like figures and stuff that are in the temples i think yeah and there's a bunch of different columns i if only we knew an archaeologist that could uh, test you <laughs> down the road for your um, your knowledge of of pillars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, now I now I understand the difference between a colonnade and a peristyle. You're all in trouble. Um, but it was the the interesting part. Thinking back to the, the Greek and Roman stuff was really that they didn't just have. I learned them as the different types of columns. Right. It's like they are uh doric or ionic or corinthian or whatever right but those mm -hmm. were not just styles of columns they were also effectively blueprints for how to build the rest of the structure they were they were known as the orders and it was like you know if you're building a column this way then the rest of the building has to go a certain way as well and it alternates between these sort of fluted panels and the sculpted panels that have you know heroes of legend or you know emperors or whatever carved onto them and so there's, there's some really interesting stuff in there that feels like an education in history that i only ever got a very brief glimpse of or didn't pay enough attention to maybe uh, when I was learning history in, in school. So yeah, that's the kind of stuff that I'm I'm trying to learn actively on the side and hoping that some of the knowledge sticks. Because when I, I think back to building the, uh, the mansard roof on the museum on Empires Season 2, and that's some terminology that has stuck with me and I can identify out there in the world now. So I'm hoping that some of the rest of this sticks and I have good examples of that in the future. In the meantime, though, uh, looking forward to the future, actually, we have some snapshots uh, from the last week. Uh, Minecraft Java Edition Snapshot 24W03A was published on January 17th, 2024. And to quote the article, we are now releasing the third snapshot of Minecraft 1.20.5. This time around, we're bringing some updates to the armadillo and the breeze, as well as accessibility improvements. In addition to a big bundle of bug fixes, we're bringing some changes to how spawn chunks are handled, which the article goes into immediately, but we're going to talk about further down the changelog. So the new features in Snapshot 24W03A include the armadillo, armadillo scute item, and wolf armor all receiving a texture update, armadillos will now also spawn in badlands, and spiders and cave spiders will run away from armadillos that are not in a rolled up state. Some other changes in 24W03A, they've adjusted the texture of the wolf collar layer to be more consistent with the new wolf armor. In accessibility settings, the default focus is now always set when entering or exiting any menu while navigating using tabs or the arrow keys. 
Some technical changes in 24W03A, the data pack version is now 28 and resource pack version is now 24. Custom villager trades can now be configured to accept items that have different tags from the expected item by adding ignore tags true in the trades NBT, and we'll talk about a way in which that affects survival in just a second. Uh, when entities leave or enter the end dimension, the area they arrive in will now stay loaded for 15 seconds, which matches the behavior of nether portals. They've also added transfer packets and cookie packets, both of which are described in more detail in the changelog, which we won't go into here because it's kind of technical and crunchy. Uh, but they have decreased the default size of the spawn chunks and made that value configurable. So a little bit more about what that means. Again, that's uh, kind of explained in plain language at the beginning of the article, so that is worth a read. But uh, to summarize, the size of the spawn chunks have changed from a radius of 10, which is a 19 by 19 area of entity ticking chunks, to a radius of 2, which is only a 3 by 3 chunk area of entity ticking chunks. This was done to reduce memory usage, loading times, and CPU usage for both single player worlds and servers. They've opted not to fully remove the spawn chunks to allow players who currently utilize this functionality to continue to do so. They've also added a new game rule, spawn chunk radius, to set the size of the spawn chunks, and possible values range from 0 to 32, where 0 completely disables the spawn chunks, and 10 is equivalent to the functionality before this change, 32 is the maximum. The default value is 2, equivalent to that 3x3 entity ticking chunk area. In datapack version 28, the Minecraft Sweeping enchantment has been renamed to Minecraft Sweeping Edge. They've added an advancement criteria trigger default block use, which triggers due to the default interaction of a block by a player, such as opening a door, and added the advancement criteria trigger any block use, which triggers due to any type of interaction with a block by a player, such as using an item on the block or its default usage. New item tags have been added, controlling what enchantments can be added to what gear. These are listed in the snapshot changelog, but they cover equipment categories like armor and weapon, with subcategories like head armor, chest armor, and sword or trident, for example. New entity tags have also been added, ignores poison and regen for entities that cannot be affected by poison and regeneration effects, illager friends for entities that illagers will consider allies unless they're assigned to a different team using the scoreboard functionality, Inverted healing and harm for entities that have inverted meanings of the healing and harm effects, usually undead mobs. Not scary for pufferfish for entities that will not cause pufferfish to puff up. Sensitive to bane of arthropods, kind of does what it says on the tin. Likewise, sensitive to impaling. There is also a wither friends list for entities that the wither will not target and which cannot harm the wither in return. Some changes to experimental features in 24W03A. The breeze now deflects all projectiles, and deflected projectiles will now deflect in the direction of the shooter. And in the trading rebalance experiment, villagers who buy armor now ignore durability, meaning they can buy damaged armor, which is one of the things that's been changed thanks to that uh, little tweak to NBT data that I mentioned earlier. There are a lot of bug fixes in this snapshot, a lot of them coming from over the holiday period, but the notable ones that I've pulled out of the changelog are that players could use water buckets and lava buckets on blocks that were out of reach. That's now been fixed, along with the output of crafting and stone cutting copper grates was inconsistent with each other. You cannot use spider eyes on baby armadillos to age them up, you now can. Feeding an armadillo a spider eye did not cancel the player eating it, that's now been fixed as well, and there are a few bug fixes that seem to be related to each other, where applying bone meal to certain blocks no longer produced particles, and uh, that's now been fixed as well. Minecraft Java Edition 24W03B was published on January 18th, 2024, to fix a crash and deliver a few minor changes and bug fixes. Changes to experimental features in 24W03B. The wind charge projectile has an updated model, texture, and animation to give it a more dynamic look and feel. Fixed bugs in 24O3B that are worth noting. Attempting to copy a quote-unquote copy of a copy book in a crafter behaves incorrectly. Some trial spawners in trial chambers spawn mobs without persistence. The game crashes when opening the configure realms menu. The hitboxes of magma cubes are too large, and items on top of soul sand or mud are rendered black. I don't know about you, Joel, but you know, sometimes when the year changes and you have trouble remembering the dates this year, like, I have that for snapshots now. I wanted to say 23W03 for that entire newsread. 
and so I'm 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 pretty confident that I said 24 the entire time but apologies if there were any inaccuracies it is the year 2024 um, but these are our first snapshots of the year as uh, forecast by Nembon in last week's discussion so uh, yeah we've got a couple of minor changes to existing stuff but there's some interesting stuff here that we wanted to pick out I mean I for one wouldn't mind if I had the ability to change you know my render distance uh from all the holiday food that i consume <laughs> yes mojang has now reduced the size of this podcast i think is the headline news <laughs> um we were growing too powerful um <laughs> but in in all seriousness no i haven't seen anybody take issue with the change to the spawn chunks um and and obviously the the technical community who would be most likely to utilize the spawn chunks as a permanently loaded area have not really spoken up to say we're against this and here's why as far as i can see right there's i haven't seen anyone really take issue with it in anything other than this is a change and i don't quite understand it therefore i don't like it it makes a lot of sense frankly because if you think about it there are very few farms that are actually more effective when built in the spawn chunks people think that more farms are affected by the spawn chunks because iron farms are so commonly placed there but that's really just because villager and zombie interactions can happen without the player being present but so many other farms rely on random ticks for uh for crop growth for example or mob spawning uh, and all of that stuff has to take place in a radius around the player so building stuff in the spawn chunks is so infrequently necessary that it does make sense to uh, shrink that stuff down and you can still make a pretty decent iron farm in a three chunk by three chunk area that's still 48 by 48 blocks so that's that's not an awful nerf if you're just going on the default size i think if it's a performance boost that's absolutely a win both for servers and for players on you know older hardware especially uh it makes it less likely for the spawn chunks to fill up with passive mobs that prevent them from spawning naturally elsewhere and i think lastly the thing to remember is that players have already had tools like the slash force load command which could load an individual chunk anywhere you wanted it to if you had admin privileges you can configure the spawn chunks if you're an admin now and and it even makes it potentially a larger area if you want it to be and then survival chunk loaders are fairly well documented at this point to the point where i haven't tried to build one but i still know how to build one just having watched enough technical players in my time so there's i think a lot to be said for the the amount of thought and care that's gone into a performance increase like this which obviously changes the way that the game functions within a certain area but doesn't change it in a way that i think is really going to be detrimental to too many people's gameplay i agree and i think that the people that are that concerned about it will quickly learn how to change it back to the way it was right yeah sure and i you know the listeners of this podcast and people that are so into minecraft that they make a podcast uh you understand the nuances and you say okay well more player control is good right yeah. and uh, i remember starting the citadel wanting to do farms wanting to figure out the spawn chunks looking up how to do that so i had to go through the manual process of finding a video online on how to find the center of where the spawn chunks start how to count them all out how to do the perimeter and it's pretty big and it took a long time uh, to do it right, to do it in a way that made sense. So if other server members came across the perimeter, they knew what they were walking into. Uh, I wanted to build some redstone farms and I wanted to know where the redstone, you know, spawn chunks were as well as the full extent of the spawn chunks. And now being able to control that and being informed that the default is such a small area. And then you can say, all right, well, I only want to increase it by what I need because I don't want to push the game performance to beyond what my server needs are or my single player world needs are. And so when we update the Citadel and eventually get this change, I'll be looking at where the iron farm is, which is thankfully not that far from um, spawn, the actual spawning area. Uh, and then same thing with the moss farm. Those are the two farms that are in the spawn chunks. I think I tried to build a gold farm at some point, but it ultimately was not it was one of those portal gold farms that just didn't work as well as I thought it was going to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the only thing we have going on there. Everything else that's in the spawn chunks, I think is just building like, you know, 
underground railroads and maybe some builds from some old server members, but nothing that requires, you know, functionality. So I'll be looking into seeing, you know, as the spawn chunk radius increases, like where does that redstone functionality fall in? So I'll have to increase the radius to something modest. Uh, but again, we have a small server. There's only four or five of us that play regularly. And I'm not too worried about performance. Uh, so far, the server hasn't had any issues in our current state with the default spawn chunks being so large. So if anything, it, our server will probably benefit. I don't know how much of that we'll end up seeing, but uh, I'm all for it. I, I love the idea of giving this kind of control to players, though, because as Minecraft gets on and it gets bigger and people continue to play it or think that they can continue to play it on older hardware, I think it's important to give people that granular control because then that just broadens the good game experience that more of Minecraft's player base can have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and you're talking about also removing an area of effectively about 90,000 blocks from the spawn chunks, <laughs> which is oh, a it's lot. Huge. Yeah, like it's if, if you if you think about it like a, a 19 by 19 area like that with 16 blocks in each chunk, you know, 16 blocks horizontally in, in either direction is like, it comes out to 304 times 304 in terms of like the square block area of that, which is 92,000 blocks. And they're reducing it to less than 3,000. So there's the <laughs> there's there's a lot less area permanently loaded. Hopefully that's going to make a huge difference performance-wise. It, it'll at least be noticeable, I think, to, to some players on older hardware. And it makes sense. I think that's one of the other things performance-wise that uh bedrock edition can rely on is the fact that the bedrock edition game doesn't have a permanently loaded area all of the time and i think it's nice that they've struck a balance because they know that players are going to have legacy stuff in their world that relies on constantly loaded activity but they know that the actual requirement for that area is not huge um and it, it makes it if anything slightly easier to understand because I couldn't tell you what a 19 by 19 chunk area centered on my spawn point looks like. Like, I don't know what's there, but if you're just saying, okay, it's three by three chunks, that's a lot easier to manage. It's a lot easier to visualize. So uh, yeah, I think my, my iron farm may even be built like less than uh, in a three chunk radius away from the spawn point. So yeah, fingers crossed that that's uh, something that works out for, for everybody. And I'll keep my ear to the ground and see if anything does come up in the discussion of this. But overall, it seems to be a pretty positive change. Uh, anything else you want to pull out of the snapshots before we move on? I'm pretty sure that I mentioned spiders running from armadillos in a previous episode, that it would be a nice feature, add mm -hmm. a bit of personality to the mob and some functionality. And uh, I'm, okay, I'm okay with with maybe patting myself on the back and going, called it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in, in a very good way. Like it's, it's, it's a very simple thing. It makes sense because they eat spider eyes. And so having spiders run away from them, it's consistent with other game mechanics like creepers running from cats, skeletons running from dogs, that kind of stuff. And I, I like the idea of an alternate way to move spiders around. Uh, I was watching the Exumavoid summary of the changes in the snapshot and uh, noticing on video how quickly the spiders move. You can't move spiders that fast with water. Yeah. And as someone that set up a three spider spawner cave spider farm in the early, early days of the Citadel and had to deal with moving them all around with water streams and waiting for that farm to quote unquote spin up, um, it is way easier uh, now, it looks like, to have a bunch of armadillos around and just have them in key places, you know, around the outside of where you want the spiders to go. They're going to run in the opposite direction and just have them funnel into whatever it is that you want. I think eventually you'll still have to use a water stream or whatever to get them up into some sort of killing chamber or down, depending on which way you're going. But my gosh, like that's, um, that's a really neat little feature. And my brain immediately went to the, the fun little farms, you know, cause I, there's not much you can do with spiders in the game other than run away or kill them. And, and I like the idea of, hurting them a little bit is kind of fun uh there could be some you know interesting player uh interaction games you know like if you had uh maybe i'm thinking of like the 
the dungeons and the the mini games that people make you know you open up a trap door and there's spiders in there and there's an armadillo at the back and it causes the spiders to rush out you know like indiana yeah. jones style into your corridor and attack the players that are there like that kind of stuff is is interesting where that would be really hard to do without this feature in the game so i think that's uh it's it's something worth noting that's a nice little kind of checkbox on adding more value to the armadillo not just focusing on wolf armor as nembon had mentioned last week I think there's tremendous comedy in the difference in size between them as well, <laughs> because armadillos are relatively small. They're like less than the size of a block, and spiders are two by two blocks space. And so it's kind of like, yeah, it, it, it's like um, a human running away from a, from a dog. It's, it's that kind of level of, of funny to me. Um, I, I guess it's not unprecedented in Minecraft terms, though. You have creepers running away from cats already, so it's not necessarily about the size. But I think it's, it's, it's pretty funny. And I think it also is a kind of a smart way of signaling to the player, hey, if the spiders are running away from the armadillo, then maybe the spider eye is the food for them, right? Like, it's a, an intuitive way yes. of... Yeah. signaling that to the player without having to beat them over the head with like this is this mob's preferred type of food so yeah i think that makes a lot of sense and i think uh, hopefully uh people will find some creative ways to use it where it will uh be uh yeah you know, what was, wasn't as as easy to corral spiders previously the other thing that i pulled out was that uh breeze reflecting projectiles was an indication to me that mojang wants players to engage them melee and I'm wondering, and you might be able to speak more to this because you have experience with trial chambers, if the breeze was too easy to kill with bow and arrow and now forcing the player to use melee weapons, having to get close to it, having to be affected by potentially that breeze projectile um, is like an intentional you know, change to make, make the mob more challenging or if not more challenging, at least have the player's engage in the mob mechanics more and be blown around the trial chamber into the into the various you know hazards that are around yeah i honestly thought they did this already it may just have been my poor timing with firing arrows at them because it might have gotten turned away by a wind charge that the breeze fired at me but i honestly thought breezes deflected projectiles anyway um because it seemed to happen more often than not when i was fighting them long range and in the instances where I've gone into a trial chamber, I've usually gone in with basic equipment. I haven't taken the time to enchant a bunch of stuff beforehand, so I've not had infinity and I've been trying to be fairly sparing with my arrows. So for the most part, when I've gone in, I've seen a couple of arrows not quite meet their mark and I've gone, okay, I need to go in and attack this thing face to face. But then that obviously triggers the, br the breezes running away mechanic where it just kind of hops over to another side of the room. So they're going to be quite difficult to fight. But I think that is part of the challenge of trial chambers and is a way of introducing something that feels very different to fight than a lot of the other mobs that will be in there that players will no doubt be used to by the time they reach a trial chamber. It's not really going to throw out anything that you've not seen before at that stage, except for the breeze. And so if the breeze is a challenge and the trial spawners currently only release one or two of them at a time so you actually have time to focus on that mob instead of just being completely overwhelmed by it so i'll, I'll maybe wait to go into another trial chamber and you know fight it out myself but i think it's a it's a decent change and one that adds a a, a decent amount of challenge to the breeze without making it completely overpowered or impossible to fight Moving on into our chunk mail this week. If you would like to email the show, the email address is spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. Keep them short, keep them sweet. It increases the likelihood of getting them on the show. First one comes in from Evil Shadow, horses, donkeys, and mules. Hello, Johnny and Joel. Hope you guys are doing well. As we know, horses, donkeys, and mules are bred using the gold food, golden carrots, golden apples, and surprisingly enchanted golden apples too. The golden apple costs nine times more gold to craft than a golden carrot, but there are equivalent in terms of animal breeding. There are no benefits for using an apple over a carrot, and breeding horses with an enchanted golden apple is just a waste of resources. So what if using the more expensive food type gave us some extra benefits than using cheaper counterparts when used for breeding horses? Using an enchanted golden apple could give players benefits to the offsprings that naturally generated horses could never achieve, like speed, jump, health, or something more than that. This could give extra uses to the notch apple for peaceful players as well. 
I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Love the podcast. Evil Shadow accidentally fed his donkey an enchanted golden apple and rage quit. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever made that mistake, but I can see it being a, an issue. That said, I've now amassed enough enchanted golden apples in my world from raiding a bunch of the nearby ancient cities that I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> I think I have about 10 or so at this stage because you can get multiples of them in some of those en ancient city loot chests. And so I am not certain what to do with them. Realistically, you only need two to get everything you need out of them in the sense of you have one that you need to eat for the balanced diet advancement and you have another one that you can craft into the banner pattern. And that's it for Enchanted Golden Apples. That's all you realistically need to do with them for the sake of completionism. Uh, so, yeah, I, I like the idea of them doing more than just providing food to the player. If they can be fed to an animal, why do they not give the animal all of those extra boosts and stuff as well? The only experience I have with golden apples is keeping them in my my battle box, my shulker box that I use when we fight the dragon. Uh, and I've not used them in any other way. I haven't really done much breeding for horses. I'm I'm sure I did it at some point, but I I think it was back before horses got their buff. Because I mean, we're talking seven plus years ago. So I'm a little biased in that I don't really interact with horses or really animals that much in Minecraft. Um, I think it's a solid concept. I like the consistency of, okay, well, if a golden carrot does this for the player and a golden apple does that for the player, then why does do they both do the exact same thing for a horse? And I think that that's, that's a cool idea to to increase the stats for players that are that involved with it. I think for me, despite it being a solid concept, it kind of falls under the matter of Mojang spending time and resources on a game feature that's not heavily utilized. You know, uh, I feel like the people that are really into horses are wondering why horses don't get more love. But if you talk to the vast majority of players and ask them how often do they use horses, I don't know that that stat is really that high. Yeah, I think once you get a Lytra, that's the, the main problem, right? But this could be an interesting opportunity to retool horses. Maybe, you know, if you feed a horse an enchanted golden apple, it gets a speed boost that lets it keep up with a, a flying player. Although then the problem becomes, how does it stay A, on the ground, or B, like, how do you not get snagged on a tree every three seconds, which is usually my problem when I'm riding a horse through the Minecraft landscape. Um, overall, though, I think this kind of falls along the same lines as player food for me, is that like variety in this sense is included in the game. It feels like for the sake of experimentation for new players, and then after that it becomes like a role play thing. Um, there are only a few efficient ways of doing things that, as per Azuma way back in the episode when we last had him on the show, players will just find the most effective way of doing something so they can get that mechanic out of the way and move on to something else. And so people so often default to food that you can acquire easily, like, you know, get a, chick a chicken cooker set up and you can eat chicken constantly, um, you know, a steak farm, because steak is probably the highest food in terms of hunger, replenishment, or a, I think a hoglin farm will get you infinite pork chops, uh, so that's a, a good alternative, and then golden carrots because they have high saturation. And players so often default to eating those types of foods that they don't use the other 30 or so food sources in the game. And the same is going to be true of breeding horses. Like, if you want to do it long term, you're going to default to whatever the cheapest type of food is. And you can trade for golden carrots from farmer villagers once they're maxed out, so you don't even need to spend gold on it. Um, so that that's obviously like a different... A different thing really like if, if you if you care enough about your horse that you're like i will feed you this enchanted golden apple and not worry that it doesn't give any additional effects or have any noticeable benefits then that's fine if that's what you want to do but ultimately food and enchanting i feel like are two systems that i personally hope are going to get retooled at some point in future because for now they keep getting stuff layered on top of them and for the longer that happens the more bloated they end up feeling you know, if a new food gets added into the game, it's usually a case of on a long enough time span spent in a world, it's not really going to matter. Sure, it's good that you can eat glow berries when you're like when I'm doing like a Minecraft bingo speed run effectively trying to, you know, try and find stuff in the cave system. The fact that, yes, glow berries are available as food there is useful to me. But for the vast majority of what we consider normal survival Minecraft gameplay, you're not going to consider glowberries a viable food source under most circumstances. 
and so i think yeah food is one of those things that could use a bit of retooling in future and if we don't see that then we're just going to see more stuff added on top of it which players are largely going to ignore i agree that the variety of food is very situational specific i remember the last time that i played modded minecraft you know starting over again fresh world and i was very focused on the mods and like going through that tech tree that i basically forgot to set up any kind of decent food source uh or waiting for things like wheat to grow or carrots was just taking forever and so i completely forgot and then when i found a river i just i ended up making a lot of kelp you know when i found some some water and i just ate kelp for the first little while until i could get up to speed and just like your glowberry example like it was good to have that it's not something i was going to do long term but it was nice to just have something accessible that i didn't have to wander the countryside trying to find cows and chickens and all that kind of stuff and when it comes to the stuff like this if they did add you know a a kind of um breeding change because of the different food types i think for clarity they'd have to do a a number of things like just adding horse stats is only appealing to the people that ride horses but if you change the look of horses maybe they get bigger maybe it's a different kind of horse thinking like you know clydesdale or a big farm horse or you know maybe something that looks more like a racehorse maybe the um, the model of the saddle on the horse looks different. Maybe it has a gold trim if you fe fed it a golden apple to indicate to you, hey, by the, way, by the way, that's my fast horse. And this other horse is the one that I used to carry it on. And it's just like a regular horse. And I think if you do it, you have to make sure that there's enough in-game information to clearly communicate to the player what has happened, but also uh, give various reasons why players might want to do it if you don't want to ride a horse at all that's fine but if you're like that horse would look really cool hitched to the front of this wagon because it's a different looking horse it looks bigger or it looks more special then i think that that could increase the usability of a feature like this yeah uh, breed two horses with enchanted golden apples the resulting horse is a unicorn <laughs> you know stuff like that <laughs> yeah and, why, why and, not right and, and can equip elytra so it becomes pegasus at the same time you know there's there's some wacky stuff you could do with that i'll leave that to the modded crowd but uh yeah there's there's certainly some stuff that they could do with it for sure uh moving on to our second email this one comes in from the bingham team with the subject of more nether biomes and structures hi joel and picks i've always thought even after the 1.16 update that the nether didn't have enough structures Maybe Mojang could add Crimson Villages that spawn in Crimson Clearings, and potentially a Warped Village variant as well. What about something like a Soul Remnant, which could be a Soul Sand version of Trail Ruins with different loot tables? Would love to hear your thoughts. The Bingham team was slayed by a Hoglin while desperately trying to find a Crimson Village. I think adding more structures to the Nether would be welcome, but... Overall, players would more than likely be more interested in the very bleak landscape of the end receiving some updates over adding things to the Nether, which just received a full update, you know, a few versions ago. Although, I mean, that was 116 and we're coming up at 121, so it's been a little while. Um, I, I feel like if we get to the point where more structures are added to the Nether or the end, I'd rather see something new th rather than just a version of a trial chamber in a different dimension right? Uh, I think trial cha chambers have enough going on that they deserve to be their own thing and not just, you know, copied over to have a version in, in the nether. Um, what version or what structures would I like to see in the nether? Um, I feel like I think of things like broken bridges that go nowhere. My brain always goes to ruins in the nether. Um, Maybe giant piglin statues could be fun and funny and quirky. I mean, they'd be of piglins, of course, because for me, they strike me as narcissistic. <laughs> I sure, don't know why. yeah. Uh, but, you know, maybe it could be made of a new resource block, so you could decide to preserve it and keep it, or you could decide, you know, decide to mine it and wreak the benefits of having um, a new block or a new tech tree, like whatever that might give you, you know, in terms of uh, the rewards there. But for me, when I think about the nether, I rather see more biomes and I feel like you could have not necessarily structures, but maybe like new, uh, points of interest or more natural features. Uh, I'm going to go to an old idea of adding some sort of like weird green goo liquid to the nether, maybe some new biome with like an eighties cartoon vibe, but that could lead to some interesting structures, uh, air quotes, like, a geyser or some weird hole in the wall where this this green stuff comes from or 
maybe it has to be if it's going to be a structure maybe it could be like a well you know kind of hinting at the the village idea uh from the the bingham team's email but going with a more of a odd mystical kind of vibe because i just villages in the nether doesn't appeal to me i'm not sure about you but i i would want something new and weird and and you know strider level weird not just like copy of existing overworld things happening in the nether yeah yeah definitely it, it the nether itself feels like it can be a place where very original stuff can happen i mean you look at the nether biomes yes they are forests but they are forests unlike the ones that you see in the overworld they have a very different biology to them and so there is a a canvas for originality there that I, I feel like the nether deserves if you're going to change anything about it. I think my instinct is that the nether structures are all very large, aside from ruined portals, which also exist in the overworld. Um, so it might be fun to see some smaller structures. And the stuff you suggested, like, you know, having, uh, you know, a, a guy or a well or something like that does does make a little bit of sense. I think if it's a remnant of piglin civilization or maybe even some signs that the overworld inhabitants had visited the nether at some stage, then that makes sense. But for one thing, the nether doesn't feel very habitable, even after they've added the materials necessary for tool progression. So it feels strange to imagine anyone wanting to build there, and this is not a call outpost for players who like to build in the nether. Um, we all know the reasons for it, and it feels like a fun challenge as a player, but it doesn't feel like something that anyone in their right mind is supposed to want to do um it's not a sustainable way of life necessarily except for piglins and even they we have examples of their civilization being effectively in ruins at this point but it feels very isolated and the bastion remnants feel like they have decayed over time and the only reason they are still there is because they are so large and there's a lot of them to still be left standing and so that's potentially a reason why we don't see any smaller structures is because the natural state of the nether is one of entropy. There is lava everywhere. The roof is all enclosed. You imagine that anything there is probably not going to survive for too long unless it has adapted to survive. And the way that the piglins have adapted is in making sort of larger structures and bartering gold and sort of surviving the way they can they even trade you fire resistance potions and they burn in lava or fire so i think a lot of the time there are clues there as to maybe why there aren't more structures in the nether is because they simply wouldn't survive the conditions of the dimension but maybe there are some ways around that in future some more creative steps that could be taken to introduce some structures to the nether i'd like to see it but like you i think there are other areas of the game that deserve a bit more attention and the nether update has allowed the nether to feel a lot more complete than it ever felt before so i think we're still riding that wave and if structures get added to the nether it's probably going to be a lot further down the line and with that out of the way, we're going to look ahead to 2024 in Minecraft. This is a topic that we had earmarked for discussion sometime in January, but obviously having been able to chat to Nembon last week, we postponed it to this week, where we wanted to talk a little about what we know is coming to the game, what we think is coming to the game, what we hope is coming to the game, and any plans or hopes for our own creative projects in the year ahead. Um, so let's start off with more general stuff. Like, uh, what, what are we hoping for this year? Uh, starting with you, Joel. Well, given the changes that they've made in recent years with sliders for accessibility, thinking about like going through nether portals, uh, the nausea effect, that kind of thing, commands that have been added for things like game ticks and now the spawn chunk radius, I'd like to see more things like that given to the player. I, I think that one of the reasons why we run a number of mods on the Citadel is for that player experience, for that granular control that default doesn't have. But as more and more of these commands come in, you depend less on things like mods for that stuff. And I think that's awesome. And so I'm hoping to see more of that. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see more of that. They seem to be going in that direction, kind of thinking about the last few updates. Uh, same thing with experimental features. I, I feel like we're probably going to be seeing more of that. Uh, we've seen more of these features being used in experimental features uh, to gather player feedback uh, on changes, especially changes that have a ripple effect or maybe rock the boat like villager trading, that kind of thing. And I think that that's uh, one, a great way to work with the community, get some feedback very clearly label them as experimental features so they don't create as much as a of an uproar uh, uh, thinking that these are definitely coming to the game 
as they are, you know, labeling them as experimental features means that, hey, things might change. These are, it's just an experiment. We're testing it. We're throwing the spaghetti at the wall and, and seeing what it looks like. And I like it. I think it's a really cool way um, to move forward. And we've only now seen, what, two minor updates it's coming up on the third? And I'm curious to see how that's going to happen because, I mean, I, for one, I didn't think we were going to get the Armadillo in a minor update. I thought that was going to come with 1.21. Yeah, yeah, and that and that's the interesting thing coming out of our discussion with Nembon last week was that there is effectively a second team or a sub team of developers that works on just the minor update features, and that those those developers can still claim upcoming features to work on and include them in minor updates if they aren't part of the projected offering for a major release, and that's really exciting because. If there are more opportunities for players to advocate for certain features being added to the game, like the Armadillo, which was obviously the result of a mob vote and a kind of big uh, campaign by Mojang to have players select a mob, I think it's a great way to illustrate the dialogue that's happening between players and the developers. And that leads to things like you were saying, like like additional accessibility settings, more fine control over elements of the game that we feel like we've had less control over previously and it leads to situations like them being able to add sliders for certain effects and uh change the enchantment glow so that potions are more visible and change the colors of potions to reflect better what they do and there's there's all kinds of little quality of life things that have happened over the last little while that now happen in minor updates instead of we have to wait for them and then they happen all at once. And so that's really exciting. And I, I'm hoping that the community in general also gets used to this as an update cycle. It's still relatively new that we're getting actual features like whole cloth armadillo-like features in minor updates. But I'm excited to see what they're going to do with that this year, especially with this being Minecraft's 15th anniversary uh, I think there's there's a lot that they maybe have planned for later this year that might take the form of big announcements and you know new spin-off games and whatnot, but might even be as as little as like some long requested player features making it into the game for the first time. I do like the idea of the minor updates being used to fill out previous features. Uh, a good example would be decorated pots being able to store items in one dot twenty dot three, right? Yeah. Uh, players blocking with a shield and then artistic stuff like the bat getting in a new look and uh, i think that those things going into the minor updates are a great way to keep the player feedback that's been around for a while um, being rejuvenated and being fresh and brought back into the game where it makes sense you know i'm not saying that they're going to take everything that players want and put it in these minor updates but i, I think that um as they discuss you know like in in minecraft live that when it's not a huge thing that warrants like waiting for a major update or if it doesn't have the marketability like um you know uh re recovery screens or minor tweaks um they, they're not as as fun to sell as part of a big update so you just roll them into the, the minor updates and keep on rolling forward but everyone benefits because the game just continues to get better and more frequently because we end up with uh roughly you know like two minor updates a year one minor update a year plus the major update so like it, it tends to be more of a a forward march as opposed to a, a big drop and then a big wait thinking of things that keep on rolling though uh looking ahead to the 1.20.5 update uh as nemon said last week the team is still planning some additional features for armadillos and wolf armor and i think we've seen in a small way some of that taking effect this week we've got some texture changes we've got the armadillos being able to scare spiders and uh i think there may still be some stuff in the pipeline uh just according to what nembon was saying they at least have it on their radar that uh you know armadillos could use a little bit more things to excite players and the wolf armor has opened up the discussion of how players use tamed wolves what players would hope or expect from tamed wolf behavior and it seems like they might even be considering stuff like respawning mechanics or at least at least making wolves smarter about their own survival um we can't really predict a whole lot else but i'm wondering if maybe letting players interact with armadillos while they're rolled up is on the table like a, a way of having a player be able to interact with an armadillo 
in a sense greater than just brushing it for scutes or dragging it around on a lead would be something really unique there aren't many mobs that we can pick up i feel like the parrot is probably one of the only ones that you can like you know you wear it on your shoulder and and that kind of thing and armadillos aren't necessarily animals that you're supposed to keep as pets and maybe there are you know reasons like you know the, the fact that they carry a lot of bacteria on their skins in real life that maybe mojang doesn't want players to be encouraged to pick up armadillos but yeah i do wonder what other ways we can interact with them that will make the armadillo a uh, a go-to feature instead of just a, a an afterthought or a, a side thought i know there is often that talk about you know discouraging people from picking up armadillos or you know playing with or interacting with animals in the real world that they shouldn't because they're in the game uh i posit the idea that maybe realize that it's a video game and you know like maybe don't pet a panda in real life and and don't poke a polar bear with a stick in real life uh <laughs> and i don't think it's on minecraft as a responsibility to um to in like communicate that to kids i feel like that should be someone else's responsibility because i think interacting with armadillos would be a lot of fun uh hear me out armadillos on ice players in boats minecraft armadillo hockey is born <laughs> using an armadillo as the park oh goodness yeah, there's <laughs> absolutely you know i mean curling whatever i just there could there could be some real fun to be had and it, like it's silly i mean it's a it's a box with legs in the face like just have some fun with it dude imagine imagine curling imagine curling but instead of the broom you're using like the archaeology brush and you're just brushing the ice as it goes <laughs> <laughs> i feel like the the um, the armadillo olympics could be on the way fairly soon um but yeah that, that's that's a that's a fun idea i if if that's not functionality in the game somebody is making that a mini game now i guarantee it i like the cartoony idea of them rolling around i know they don't do that in real life in terms of how they actually travel but i know i've seen it in some point in my life of a cartoon character i i think um raya in the last dragon the armadillo like you know it's as big as a horse but like it rolls up and and rolls like a bowling ball uh in the film i just that kind of stuff is fun and i it's not realistic in any means for one it's a box in minecraft it's not round at all um but it just it would be funny to kind of find that happy medium of like using it to move around somehow you know in the same way that we can ride striders in the game uh i feel like using the armadillo in some sort of fun and weird and maybe not natural world way would would be would be good um as far as wolf farmer and stuff like that i it's it's a low chance very low chance i am kind of holding out for new wolf models i think it would be fun to have some variety there or at the very least some different wolf textures you know like similar to cats you know give us a brown wolf give us a gray wolf give us a white wolf just anything to help you know that armor feature feel a little bit more robust a little bit more well-rounded uh, i noticed that they had changes to the way that the collar displays on mm -hmm. the wolf armor now and that to me is another it's a good feature you know it allows that color that players add to the collar to be seen around the armor uh, i think that'll help I, I there's still no indication that we're getting colored or the ability to dye the armor so the ability to keep the color of the collar visible is good uh, but i'd like to see more more color within the wolf texture itself because otherwise it's just you know if p players end up loving wolf armor and they want to have three or four wolves then the only thing you've got to tell them apart is just a little colored ring around their neck whereas if you had you know a, a gray one a black one a brown one it'd be a lot easier it'd be i think a lot more fun for people that are going to be engaging in that feature it seems like such a no-brainer that i imagine it's coming and it's just taking them a little while that, that would be my my assumption and i may be proved wrong on this still it may just be like outside of the scope of what they plan to do but i i would really hope because it seems like the thing that players would want even if players aren't fully expressing this i i think it's maybe something that they have assumed is arriving at some stage and that's why they're not saying we need more colors you know um but i i think i think that that kind of idea is you know e easy easy to imagine players wanting so i i think that maybe they'll they'll have planned for it um the other stuff moving forward into 1.21 um is that there's a few things that we've touched on in the past that we know still have to be resolved from the update that we already have like a use for trial keys like we know that's coming at some point 
personally i just hope it's something that the community finds satisfying because i think a lot of people if it's not you know the key to some new challenge or you know it doesn't add a a major new feature along with it people are going to feel disappointed by it not recognizing that things which have long-term appeal are also very important like for example if you could use a trial key like a lodestone compass and it interacts with a specific chest until you unlock it again so like you can lock a chest with a key it then becomes bound to that specific chest maybe it points you in the direction of that specific chest and then once you unlock it you can move that chest around and then you can lock it again using the the same or a, a different trial key which keeps them reusable i think there's stuff like that, that you could use that'd be really neat for players long term a lot of role play stuff another way to keep your equipment safe on servers if the chest then also becomes unbreakable um you know there's a there's a lot of different uh functionality that you can add to it which isn't necessarily the most bombastic thing in the world you know a key with a skull on it isn't necessarily going to unlock you know some fancy new dungeon with a boss for you to fight but then that seems like a short-term experience where using them for storage and other things could sound like a, a more long-term solution to uh to what to do with trial keys i like that idea as well because then it gives you another chest model that you could use decoratively you know yeah. something with a big old cartoon lock on the front of it you know maybe it's a different color maybe we get a chest that's no longer that weird orange maybe it's it's something a little bit different you know uh something darker maybe that could be that could be fun to to mess around with and and have in your builds and have two functions you know, like have the aesthetic version but also have like you said the functionality of of locking and unlocking and i think that from a multiplayer standpoint especially on public servers like that could be a really cool thing to have uh or on on friendly competitive servers you know like you're trying to be the first to collect a certain amount of items or um you know have maybe some sort of like secretive you know or like minecraft bingo you know, like you just you don't want the play the other players to know how far you are in the current challenge so you're putting all of your results in this locked chest until you all reveal your poker hands and say like oh well i've got 25 of this and 30 of that and so i win the challenge or whatever i think that kind of stuff has knock-on effects of usability down the line even being able to use keys on a chest in a redstone contraption so that it's locked and doesn't uh, have items sucked out of it by a hopper until you right. unlock it again. Like there's there's bits and pieces like that that I think it could be could be used for. And there are ways of doing that stuff already, but it depends how elegant the solution is and how much different gameplay it provides compared to stuff that's already out there. Like we had the discussion about windowed chests that somebody sent in last week that Nembon was able to provide a bit of insight into the redundancies and the fact that, you know, there's already stuff in the game that mm -hmm. covers that functionality. So there there are maybe a couple of uh, a couple of things here and there, but hopefully they've got something a bit more unique planned for for trial keys. Now, moving on to what the stuff that is harder to speculate about is any larger content in this update, any updates to biomes, any new materials that will be added, that kind of thing. And the one thing I wanted to highlight was that every major update since the Nether update, and including the Nether update, has included new tree types. Uh, I'm counting Caves and Cliffs as a single update here since it was a part one and part two, and that was a new tree type, but not necessarily a new wood type because it added azalea, uh, which added new leaves, but not new wood because it still uses oak wood. I wonder if Mojang is going to take a break from the pattern of adding new tree types because we have had six or seven new wood types since then right we've got both of the the nether ones we've got mangrove we've got cherry we've got bamboo there's like a bunch of stuff that's been added more recently and they could take a break from that kind of pattern they could let it breathe a little but the flip side to that is if they are still interested it could be a way to bring back more biome vote runners up because many of the biomes that they have suggested in polls in the past at minecraft live have led to baobab trees palm trees you know other bits and pieces like that different sources of wood that's how we got mangrove trees into the game in the first place was as part of the swamp biomes so i think there are certainly more places for them to pull ideas from and revamping the badlands or the savannas could support the addition of the armadillo the only counterpoint to that really being that they probably had some ideas for what's going into this update since before the armadillo was voted into the game so it might be much more difficult to work on a, a revamp of a biome as a reaction to the armadillo being uh you know being voted into the game 
but the uh, the counterpoint to that is that I think it'd be really cute if rolled up armadillos, you know, were blending in with the tumbleweed that they were going to add to Badlands if those biomes won the vote. So there's uh, there's a, there's a bit of flexibility I think in reintroducing ideas that they've had voted out or come runner up in uh, in biome polls in the past. I wonder if using the minor updates for something like going back and perhaps filling out Azalea as having a wood type as opposed to just a leaf block type would be something that they could do to kind of remove that expectation of new major update equals new tree and or wood type. Because if it's not consistently in the major numbered updates, then that means that players wouldn't necessarily expect it every time. It would just like, well, we'll get one when they think of one that's worth adding, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure a lot of it has to do with the fact that when you add a new wood type, then you end up with all of the planks and stairs and slabs and fences and everything else that goes along with it, including now new things like hanging signs and all that stuff. So yeah, I don't know about a new wood type, especially because the only thing we have to go on from what I remember is the idea of tinkering is is a theme that they have and i find it harder to speculate on the major updates now i'm not sure about you but because they haven't been revealing the name during minecraft live or even early in the development process they seem to want to wait and then once they know what features are going to be in it then they reveal the name and i find that that makes it a little bit harder to speculate because uh things like the uh, trails and tales like it gives you at least some sort of theme that you can move forward with and kind of let your brain wander down a specific path whereas with minecraft being such a wide open sandbox game if someone says hey what do you think's coming in 1.21 you're like i mean it could be anything <laughs> you know like who knows like i couldn't have predicted cherry groves you know for the life of me when they came into the game uh so for me uh you know the idea of tinkering is really the, the thing that has stuck with me and um we do get a fair amount of email about chiseling blocks to make variants of existing textures. Like that seems to be something we hear of a, a lot. And I don't think we'll see that. I don't think we're going to see a chisel to the game. I don't think that that goes with how the game currently works with the stone cutter and the way that um, adding existing textures over other block types just to get a different color in like a brick. Um, it doesn't seem to be something that Mojang is is interested in. Uh, but something that's piqued my interest in the last little while has been a fairly new mechanic, which is adding things like layers to blocks. And that goes back to giving more control to players. So things like pink petals from the cherry groves and how you can click on the block four times to get four different textures. Uh, and it depends on which way you're facing as to how that pattern reveals itself and allows for a huge amount of customization and control when doing a little bit of decoration. But if those things could be translated into something more useful than just a pink flower, uh, I was talking about this on my stream on the weekend, things like chips or mulch, garden stones, green sprouts, uh, maybe even just changing how existing mushrooms are placed and, and have them work more like candles, you know, like that kind of thing uh, could be really, really interesting. and. I think that in the opposite way of your point about adding new wood and new wood types, by adding a single block like a pink petal, depending on what you can place it on, uh, pink petals obviously restricted to uh, dirt and grass and, and those kind of things, um, as opposed to stone or, or more natural or more like manufactured things like wood. Uh, if you have a, a new texture layer, I guess for lack of a better way to say it, um, when you can use that to be layered over any other block in the game or at least a number of other blocks in the game it increases the amount of textures that you have access to as a builder and as a player without adding you know 14 different new items into the inventory which i yeah. think is an important point you know um, and bonus points if it's something that can go layered vertically like vines or glow like it mm -hmm. and i don't know what that is i couldn't think of like a brown mulch idea you know like i guess dead vines like i, I couldn't think of anything that would kind of as as nembon mentioned last week replace the things we already have with vines and with glow like and like it just making a better vine doesn't really excite like you'd have to come up with something else that would go on on the wall um but yeah I, that kind of stuff i think could be um giving more creative control as well as more 
behind the scenes control like we've seen with the tick command and that kind of stuff i think that could be really fun yeah i i totally agree with you that it's really difficult to speculate on updates without knowing the name and even the theme is something that we've put together based on just them reusing a couple of significant words in the minecraft live presentation but it's right. not, not necessarily 100 percent confirmed that's what they're thinking of internally as the theme of the of the update and obviously on the one hand we know that's a good thing that they haven't released the name because it helps the community lower their expectations or at least not overhype the update to the point where they feel disappointed but obviously for us the flip side is that we don't have a whole lot else to go on um but that's what keeps the surprises coming throughout the year which uh which i think is is a great thing so where do we feel like we're at the start of 2024 in terms of personal projects like have you got something that you're thinking right this is definitely what i'm doing after west hill are you still moving on to the sci-fi project are you still not considering anything beyond west hill while you're still working on that project how are you feeling about that right now the focus is definitely finishing up west hill i'd, I'd like to check that box before it ends up uh bleeding into the countryside and just taking the entire year because i i like it uh, i might maybe grumble a little bit about how long it's taking on the calendar you know on the podcast but i really really enjoy it and in a similar way to sitting and down and and drawing and getting really into something like i can just lose myself in what i'm doing and all of a sudden you know the entire stream has gone by and all i've been doing is texturing roads and planting grass and it seems mundane but i really like that that finished look so i'm pushing to to finish that up and and do all the things that we mentioned earlier in the show in in the login um and then after that I think there's two important things. Yeah, I definitely want to switch gears. I'm thinking like sci-fi, something technical or something where I can combine the technical builds. I'm looking forward to using the crafter uh, and I don't see Westel being finished a heck of a lot sooner than the crafter actually being in the game. So it could be a very nice timing of wrapping up Westhill and then using some of the new things coming in Minecraft to kind of shake off the medieval vibe and kind of go try something new. Because I think that will kind of reinvigorate my inspiration and my gameplay and ideas and things. And in a way, also, technically, um, because I've been spending so much time in Westdale and there's no farms in Westdale other than like the aesthetic planted farms. Whenever I need more resources, I have to go to the other farms that are in, you know, other zones on the server and collect things. And because there's not a huge player population, very often those farms aren't loaded for a good chunk of time. So the farms are not very effective. So I'd like to incorporate like having, you know, personalized versions of all the different farms that you want in Minecraft in a localized area that are loaded as I'm building whatever imaginary sci-fi stuff that I'm doing. And the caution that I have there is the more I think about that, the bigger the project becomes. And I don't necessarily want to jump from a three-year project to another three-year project. So forefront in my brain is, yes, I have these ideas. It's going to require a lot more planning. I don't want to just jump into this sci-fi zone and, and continue on with it without enough thought ahead of time. And I think to do that, one of the things that I'm going to do is bop around the server and, and, uh, fix up some things like we're going to have to figure out what's going to happen with the spawn chunks. Now uh, I'm going to double check the iron farm to make sure that's working. Uh, I want to uh, check a few other things in the nether. There are um, some things in the modern city that would be a really nice diversion from the themes in the medieval town of West Hill going into something like building skyscrapers or apartment interiors, modern streets that kind of thing could be really fun now that we have more textures in the game since the last time i played in southport uh, which is the name of the, the modern city on the server so those i think will give me uh little breaks uh little technical builds uh things that just i can get done in a weekend or maybe a month of streaming things like that will be a fun way to let the idea of the sci-fi zone kind of percolate and for me to decide what I want to do and also look for the best location for it because of the longevity of the Citadel. Uh, we're not looking back and we have no intention of starting over anytime soon because of all the work that people have put in. So it's nice to think about, okay, well, I don't have to rush into the next project. Like I can take my time, try to find the next location, try to think about what logistics and what infrastructure I need in order to make this move worth it you know a uh, shulker farm definitely something that i want to make on the server for my own benefit and the benefit of everyone else and so those are the things that i'm i'm looking at and i'm just cautiously 
pacing myself to make sure I don't jump from one giant thing into another giant thing. Because that seems to be how I naturally play sandbox games. I'm the same way with Satisfactory. I didn't build small factories. I built like a giant transformer factory the size of a biome. So, and it's encompassed that entire save. And it makes it difficult after a while to break out of it. And you never feel like you're done. And I think that's one of the things that I'm really pulling some satisfaction out of finishing up these roads and valleys and, and riverbanks in West Hill is that I'm feeling done with them. The whole area isn't finished, but I, I now can walk through that East Farm Road and not think about, oh, I need to fix that or oh, I haven't finished that yet. Like it's done. And I, I like that feeling. So by moving forward with smaller projects, I think I'll have more satisfaction with what I'm doing in Minecraft this year. And so I'm looking forward to having that change of pace. Nice. Yeah, I, I, I really want to start a modern build area somewhere. Like, I think that's going to be one of my goals for this year, probably later this year, if anything. And I think it would be really fun to build with the idea of thinking of satisfactory, using the crafter in a situation where you can start a bunch of farms in one area and effectively build a factory around them. Because I think a lot of people starting in 1.21 are going to start playing Minecraft that way, where the goal is production. It's not necessarily about building individual farms dotted around all over the place and decorating them and that's that kind of stuff. I think there are going to be a lot of people who are playing the game a bit more like Factorio once the once the crafter starts to appear and it's just going to effectively be a vending machine for most items that you can feasibly craft that way, which is an exciting prospect. I think that's kind of fun and we'll see if that's the way of life I adapt to once the update arrives. But I think for now, I'm starting off this year planning to do a lot more building. My first major project of the year is a build. I'm planning on doing a bit more farm-related stuff, but taking Nembon's approach and decorating farms, especially if they're already fast enough that that sort of optimal efficiency that means no blocks around them or, or, or whatever barely matters. Um, and I think I'm mostly just trying to start, as I said earlier, with a foundation of research and a, a deeper understanding of what I'm doing and how to explain what I'm doing and also not shying away from building for the sake of building. It's not like I have difficulty coming up with reasons to build aesthetically but also I find myself avoiding building because I don't want to do it without a tutorial being involved some way and, and making some content out of it but I also struggle to find something new to say with the tutorial and so the building becomes an afterthought or something I do on streams. So I think that's where I want to start shifting things is to recognize that building something is not always going to be something that you can package neatly into like a specific video or whatever. I, th I think I, I want to do a little bit more building for building's sake. And that means that my world is going to start looking very different and, and I can start experimenting with different styles. And if a modern build area starts up, then that's absolutely going to be the way it goes because modern builds to make them feel contemporary is not particularly fast <laughs> it's not like you, you can't throw together a building like a skyscraper or whatever in the same sense that you throw together like a few medieval houses right like that there is a an art to it that is strangely difficult because you've got to make it look like it's an intentional modern building and not just a big box that you built in minecraft and and so many modern buildings especially like urban skyscraper style style developments rely on a lot of straight lines and straight lines in minecraft can look boring and so it's a difficult like line to to draw about how you make something look intentional uh and and modern and and keep with that style without it feeling like you just peel it up until you couldn't go any further and then turn that into a big box so that there's there's a bit a bit of research that's going to go into into that process but yeah for me i think really the only goal i'm going into 2024 with is do more building because i don't know where the rest of the update is going but i know that halfway through the year we're just going to get this really interesting shift towards the technical side of things with the crafter and being able to automate so much more and and that's the side that i'm i'm effectively building up to so i'm trying to get a bunch of that stuff if not out of the way, then I want to get a bunch of building done in the first half of the year so that I can dedicate the second half of the year to something more technical if it's if it feels like that's where the revolution is happening. 
And I think moving into a modern city style would be great for that architecture stuff that you're researching because in watching some videos on city planning, uh, city planner plays, you know, like city skylines too, or something like that, you hear a lot from those people in, in that profession talking about, you know, what makes a city interesting, you know, how do you keep the downtown, you know, skyscrapers from blocking out the sun and making it a miserable place to live and having different zones for retail and residential and park space and all of that stuff. And also, I mean, you live in an old part of the world. Uh, Halifax is one of the older cities in the country for me. And there's layers, you know, like there's buildings that are 150 years old and they're not very big and they look ancient, but then they're right next to brand new world trade centers and stuff like that. And the city has to find a way to make it work. But having that layer of history in a city is what makes it interesting. It what It's what keeps it from being a bunch of glass boxes that are really, really boring. And um, it's really fun to see how to work that out in Minecraft. And as someone that has built a couple of high-rise buildings in Minecraft, it is incredibly time-consuming. I, I want to say, I, I don't think that it would rival the size of West Hill, but one of the really big skyscrapers in Southport it, it's definitely bigger than the keep, definitely bigger than the keep in terms of the blocks in and, and like the number of rooms inside of it and all that kind of stuff. Because the, the scale, when you have to work in Minecraft and you want maybe like an apartment inside of that building to feel roughly like a one bedroom apartment would in a busy city. And you start thinking, all right, well, there's four apartments per floor and I've got 16 floors. And like the next thing you know, like you're just up to your eyeballs and and how to build all these things and fill it out and have it look good. I actually ended up dialing back and you know you're talking about getting some technical builds in later on and you could maybe put things in the basement or in what would be the utility room or the furnace room or maybe like the air conditioning unit that might be on on the roof and then inside of that have your technical builds like maybe that's where your creeper farm is or whatever. We've got a concrete maker that was very much needed in the modern city. And I've hidden that inside of one of the big skyscrapers so that I don't have to build all the apartments that <laughs> would be that high up and just allow me to, you know, inc like use some of that space and eat it up a little bit because I quickly realized that I had bitten off way more than I could chew when I built that first building. Yeah. So there's maybe industrial area slash modern city project at some point in future, who can say. Um, but for now, that's going to wrap up our episode of The Spawn Chunks. You can nerf the Spawn Chunks in-game, but you can't make our podcast smaller. You can find more information about the show and links to some of the stuff that we talked about today by visiting thespawnchunks.com. The music for the show is composed by me. The Spawn Chunks is proud to be a listener-supported podcast. If you're getting some value out of the show, why not consider putting some value back in? You can do that at patreon.com slash thespawnchunks. Pledging at any level there gets you an invite to our patrons-only Discord chat. You can listen to the show live when we record it every month. Monday. Our monthly Minecraft audio hangout is coming up on Saturday, so you'll be able to uh, join in for that and share some screenshots of what you've been building in Minecraft this month. We currently have 323 patrons, which is up one from last week. As always, there is always room for more. Special thanks go out to our content engineer patrons, Hunter555, Jumbo Sale, Mind Trip Media, Party Voyager, and Yitz. Thank you all for your support on this episode. Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. You can find us at The Spun Chunks on social media. Personal recommendations are by far the best way to share the podcast. Just tell a friend about The Spun Chunks and that they can find the show on their favorite podcast app or Apple Music, Spotify, and even YouTube. Be sure to leave a rating and a review on your favorite platform. You can email the show at spunchunkmail at gmail.com. The RSS feed is linked on the spunchunks.com along with our show notes. The patron-only RSS feed is on the Patreon page, and that's where you can listen to the Render Distance, the extended version of the podcast. My name is Johnny, but online I go by Pixlriffs. You can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash Pixlriffs, where the Minecraft Survival Guide is currently in its third season. I also stream three days a week on Twitch, where I do behind-the-scenes work for the aforementioned YouTube series, and I'm the voice of the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, which is on hiatus until season 10 starts, but you can find us through a quick YouTube search. Aside from that, I'm at Pixlriffs on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? Everything that I'm doing online can be linked at joelduggan.com. That includes the Citadel Cafe, my other podcast about sci-fi and fantasy entertainment. Sat down and recorded our uh, review of Rebel One. No, 
Rebel Moon. Rebel Moon? Part one. It's a long title for a movie that we had a lot to say about. So go and check that out at thecitadelcafe.com. I'm Joel Duggan on social media and of course Joel Duggan on Twitch where I stream Thursday through Sunday, mostly building on the Citadel Minecraft server, but I of course play other games too. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite, but we're trying to see more of it this year.